Hey, what's going on, you guys? It's Aces High, and today we're going to be continuing our uh, Napoleonic Wars uh, epic history TV, just awesome trip that we've been on. Um, when I left, when I last left you guys, uh, Napoleon had just suffered a pretty big defeat in Russia, lost a lot of troops due to various different things, um, and he was on the retreat. Uh, this next one takes place sometime within the next year because it's 1813 now, and uh, it's titled "The Road to uh, Was at Leipzig." I guess, uh, seems German, I think that's German, um, anyway, and, uh, yeah, I don't know what's gonna happen, uh, this one's another long video, it's gonna be, the video is about 26 minutes, so it's probably gonna be like a 32 minute video, um, but last time I split it up, a bunch of you guys got mad and wanted the whole video in one piece, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna roll on through, uh, let me know what you guys think, and I'll, uh, I'll let you know if I have any questions. Um, before we get started, as always, if you guys haven't, uh, go ahead and subscribe to me and to Epic History TV. Uh, I release videos every day. They release solid content. It's a win-win. Anyway, I'll sit back. I'll shut up. Let's get started. Eighteen twelve had been a disastrous year for Napoleon. His invasion of Russia had led to the almost total destruction of an army of half a million men. Now Poland and Germany were wide open to Russian attack. Some advised Emperor Alexander that this was the time to make a favorable peace with Napoleon. Russia's own armies had been mauled and Western Russia devastated. But Alexander was determined to see Napoleon defeated for good, oh, wow. to free Europe from his clutches, and avenge Moscow's destruction by taking Paris. Napoleon's wow. allies were deserting him. Prussian troops had already agreed a truce with the Russians. Schwarzenberg's corps marched back to Austria, which assumed a policy of watchful neutrality. Napoleon had left Marshal Murat in charge of the remnants of the army, but he left for the Kingdom of Naples, what? hoping to cut a deal with the Allies that would let him keep his throne. Oh my god, out of all the Marshals, now I'm really excited about the Marshal series uh, after this, because this, I mean, Marshal Murat, he, uh, he's one of my, I mean, <laughs> you see him so much, he just, he's got to be one of your favourites, you know, just... I didn't expect that. I thought he was incredibly loyal to Napoleon. Um, I understand Napoleon is uh, it's not looking good, but I really didn't think he'd jump ship. He was replaced by Napoleon's stepson, Eugène, who'd proved himself a brave and able soldier in Russia, but was unused to independent command, and now faced odds of four to one. Wow. As Russian forces advanced through Poland, he continued to retreat west, leaving garrisons to hold strategic fortresses, most of which were soon besieged. On the 7th of February, Russian troops entered Warsaw unopposed. Napoleon's Polish client state, the Duchy of Warsaw, effectively ceased to exist. Wow. Three weeks later, Russian troops entered Berlin, while Sweden joined the Allies. Sweden it's not was ruled good at all. by Napoleon's former Marshal Bernadotte, now officially known as Crown Prince Karl Johann. Men Isn't that the uh, the Marshal that... Uh, God, I don't even really remember it. I specifically remember two Marshals were supposed to come in and fight a battle and he opted not to and almost got court-martialed or did get court-martialed or something over it. Um, is, isn't that the same guy? Bernadotte. That, that just sounds right. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm mistaking of somebody else. Let me know. Many would accuse him of betraying Napoleon. I agree. But he'd always been clear that once he became Sweden's crown prince, he'd pursue Swedish interests, oh. which is what he now claimed to do. In exchange for Norway, to be taken from France's ally, Denmark, and one million pounds from Britain. Bernadotte agreed to join what was now the sixth coalition against France since the revolution. 
wow. with an army of 30,000 troops. Ten days later, King Frederick William of Prussia declared war on France. It followed weeks of indecision. The king was widely seen as a weak character and terrified of Napoleon. But with guarantees of Russian military support, the return of lost territory, and enormous financial and material aid from Britain, he agreed to field an army of 80,000 men. Isn't it funny what, uh, what money can buy? I mean, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of other reasons that many of these uh, people joined the war against Napoleon. But uh, I'll bet you anything, the money certainly helped a lot. On the 17th of March, he issued a proclamation to the people of Prussia and Germany. And mein Volk, to my people, summoning them to fight for Prussia and Germany's honour, in what would soon be known as the German War of Liberation. The Prussian army had been greatly reformed since its humiliating defeat to Napoleon in 1806. A military commission headed by General von Scharnhorst had sacked nearly 200 old generals and abolished flogging, expanded recruitment and introduced exams for officers, and overhauled training, wow. tactics and drill. When Napoleon met the new Prussian army in battle two months later, he remarked, these animals have learned something. Small consolation, they'd learned most of it from him. As his enemies massed in Germany, Napoleon was in Paris, working tirelessly to build a new army with which to face them. 137,000 new conscripts joined the army, and laws passed to call up 100,000 more, while 40,000 veterans from the army in Spain, 16,000 Marines, and 80,000 men of the National Guard, a home defense force, were... So what you're telling me is that uh, although he is raising a new army, um, it's mostly made up of just new people, not experienced people. I mean, I get the 40,000 veterans from Spain. Uh, or, I mean, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, but a lot of their army isn't made up of very experienced people, I guess. I guess there's veterans from Spain, what, brand new people, a bunch of them. Some Marines should be well-trained. And then the National Guard, they're probably not trained that well. So, what, you have 56,000 well-trained soldiers out of all those were transferred to Germany the new conscripts were nicknamed Marie Louise's after Napoleon's young wife who passed the new conscription laws in his absence they were young and raw two-thirds were teenagers wow. and there was a severe lack of experienced officers and NCOs in short the countless irreplaceable veterans now lying beneath Russian soil. There was also a critical shortage of cavalry, a crisis mocked by British satirists. It would take Napoleon longer to replace the many thousands of horses and trained horsemen who perished in Russia. When Napoleon left Paris for Germany in mid-April, the French situation was precarious. Eugène had been forced back behind the river Elbe to the fortified city of Magdeburg. Dresden, the capital of Saxony, had fallen to the Prussians. The Duchy of mecklenburg schwerin became the first German state to defect from Napoleon's confederation really? of the Rhine. Russian Cossacks raided as far as Hamburg, inspiring local revolts against French occupying forces. Were there really that many revolts and everything going on at the time? Or was it just that uh, people saw that Napoleon was starting to lose the war and they wanted to be on the winning side? I mean, uh, what do you guys think, you know? Meanwhile, Austria stood on the sidelines, so far declining to back either side. 
Napoleon's miraculous feat of organisation meant he now had more than 200,000 troops in Germany. And the Emperor's personal magnetism was undimmed. The morale of his army was high. The Russians, on the other hand, lost their iconic commander, Field Marshal Kutuzov, to pneumonia on the 28th of April. His role was taken over by General Wittgenstein. Russian troops were exhausted and far from home. Their army weakened by the need to contain French garrisons across Poland and Germany. Prussia and Sweden had yet to fully mobilise their strength, and Allied forces barely mustered a hundred thousand men. Hmm. They were wow. now heavily outnumbered by Napoleon, and the French Emperor decided to strike quickly. He ordered Marshal Davout to Hamburg, with 35,000 men, to secure his northern flank. He would march against the Russian and Prussian forces converging on Leipzig to force a decisive battle. Victory would make Austria think twice about joining the Allies, allow him to rescue the 90,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, and re-establish his dominance over Europe. As Napoleon advanced on Leipzig, the Allies faced a predicament. To risk battle against Napoleon's larger army, or give up Germany without a fight, a potentially devastating blow to Allied morale and any chance of winning Austria over to their cause. Allied headquarters made the bold decision to attack. They knew most of Napoleon's army was made up of raw conscripts that their own troops were better trained, and had yeah. a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. I mean, even without the cavalry and artillery advantage, I'd imagine that, I mean, just the troops alone, you've got all these young, new soldiers, some of them are teenagers, you know, uh, ki just kids, and uh, they have no training, and a lack of officers, and uh, means that no, there's nobody there to train them to be proper soldiers, it just... It makes for a mess of an army. The Allies agreed that as Napoleon crossed the Sala River, they would hit his right flank before he could concentrate the full mass of his forces. The two armies were on a collision course, but Napoleon's shortage of cavalry meant he lacked information about Allied movements. Hmm. On the 1st of May, Marshal Bessières commanding the cavalry in Murat's absence, was carrying out reconnaissance himself when he was hit by a cannonball wow. and killed instantly. Bessier was the second of Napoleon's marshals to be killed in action, and like Lan, an old comrade and trusted friend. The Allies were able to surprise Napoleon, falling on Marshal Ney's third corps near Lutzen. Ney's troops had to cling on in the face of a Russian and Prussian onslaught, while Napoleon rapidly redirected his other corps to fall on the enemy's flanks. At one stage, Napoleon had to personally help rally routing troops as they broke in the face of determined Prussian assaults. But on the whole, his young conscripts fought with courage Despite hours of savage fighting, Wittgenstein could not exploit his early advantage. As French reinforcements arrived, the battle turned against him. Towards dusk, the Allies were forced to break off the engagement. Though they'd inflicted around 22,000 casualties, losing just half as many men. General von Scharnhorst, wow. mortally wounded, was among them. Crucially, Napoleon's lack of cavalry meant he was unable to pursue the enemy, who retreated in good order. Expecting the Prussians to fall back on Berlin, Napoleon sent Marshal Ney in pursuit, while he continued east. 
but the Allied army stayed together, withdrawing to a defensive position at Bautzen, deliberately close to the Austrian border, hoping to entice Schwarzenberg to intervene, That's smart. and daring Napoleon to violate Austrian neutrality. That's incredibly smart. That's such a good play. Neither happened. Hmm. Instead, Napoleon ordered Ney to swing south to fall on the Allies' northern flank, while he launched a frontal assault to pin them in place. The battle lasted two days, as French infantry struggled forward against the Prussian and Russian lines. But a misunderstanding over Ney's orders caused a delay that allowed the Allies to narrowly escape Napoleon's trap. Oh, wow. Once more, the Allies fought with great determination and inflicted many more losses than they suffered. There were more casualties during the pursuit, including the next day General Duroc, Grand Marshal of the Palace, responsible for Napoleon's personal arrangements, and his closest surviving friend. Riding with Napoleon's staff, a freak cannon shot ricocheted off a tree and disemboweled him. His slow, painful death wow. deeply upset Napoleon. It ricocheted off a tree? The Emperor continued his pursuit to Breslau, once again hindered by his lack of experienced cavalry, while Oudinot was sent north to take Berlin, but was held at Luckau by von Bülow's Prussian corps. On the 2nd of June, with both sides strained to breaking point, neutral Austria proposed a ceasefire, which, to the surprise of many, Napoleon accepted. Hmm. Wow, interesting. So at the end of the day, I mean, Prussia did get, in, I mean, uh, Austria did get involved anyway. Um, very interesting. Also, it's, it's interesting that Napoleon would accept it. I understand why you should accept it. I mean, you have untrained soldiers, you don't have horses, even if you want to continue the war, if you just have a ceasefire for now, uh, it gives you time to kind of, you know, regrow your forces, uh, rest up your soldiers, train them better get some horses, get some cavalry, things like that. Um, so it makes sense they did it, but the, yeah, I just felt like he was so power hungry at this point that uh, he wasn't thinking clear, and I, I guess I'm just a little surprised that he accepted it. The armistice of Plaswitz would last more than two months, a period of intense diplomacy and military mobilization by both sides. Napoleon wanted time to rebuild his cavalry, a shortage of which had allowed the Allies to escape twice. But he also wanted to keep Austria on side, which he feared might join the Allies with 200,000 troops, even though Emperor Francis I was now his father-in-law, since Napoleon's marriage to his daughter Marie-Louise in 1810. Austrian Foreign Minister Clemens von Metternich, who'd become one of 19th century Europe's most influential statesmen, now took center stage. Metternich wanted peace and to see Austria restored as a great European power, which meant Napoleon contained, but not crushed, which would hand too much power to Russia. In June, he traveled to Dresden to ask Napoleon to make concessions while promising the Allies that if he did not, Austria would join them. But Napoleon dismissed Metternich's terms out of hand. He would oh, wow. not return the Illyrian provinces to Austria, agree to the repartition of Poland, or the breakup of the Confederation of the Rhine. All were out of the question. Napoleon famously threw his hat to the ground in fury. Peace and war lie in your majesty's hands, Metternich is said to have warned him. Today you can still make peace. Tomorrow it may be too late. But Napoleon preferred war, 
to what he called a humiliating peace. I mean, to be fair, they are asking for basically everything back. It's, uh, it's one thing if they say, hey, Austria wants their sections back, but what about the Rhine, like the German areas? Does he have to give those up? I mean, you know, there's just, it, it seemed like they were asking for too much, in my opinion. On of August 1813, Austria joined the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. The Allies now had a numerical advantage of 3 to 2, and a new strategy, the Trachenberg Plan. Recognising Napoleon's genius, the Allies would avoid battle with the Emperor and instead target his marshals, threaten Smart. his flanks and wear down French forces until it was time to close in for the kill. Over the next few months, the coalition would also receive massive material support from Britain, including £8 million in silver and gold coin, 200 cannon with transport, 120,000 firearms, 18 million rounds of ammunition, wow. 23,000 barrels of gunpowder, 30,000 swords oh and sabres, 150,000 uniforms, 175,000 pairs of boots, 1.5 million pounds of beef, biscuit and flour, and 28,000 gallons of rum and brandy. The total Jesus value of British Christ. aid to the coalition in 1813 was 11.3 million pounds. Today, we're... That's incredible. The British just... I mean, wow. Imagine if the British didn't get involved in this war at all. If they just sat on the sidelines the entire time, do you think Napoleon would have steamrolled and just ran through Europe or uh, or not? I mean, there are plenty of other things that stood in his way, but the British definitely haven't been easy for him. Worth around half a billion dollars. Napoleon, meanwhile, had turned Dresden into a major supply depot and strengthened his cavalry arm, though it remained a pale shadow of its glorious past. Murat returned to lead it his secret approach to the Allies having been rebuffed. Oh, it was a secret approach. I thought Napoleon knew about it. How, what, what was the excuse then that he gave to go back? You know, what did he tell Napoleon? Hey, sorry, I know it's the middle of battle, but I got to run home and check on what, I think I left the oven on? I mean, you know, <laughs> like, what was his excuse? Does somebody know that? Because if I was Napoleon and one of my marshals said, hey, Sorry, yeah, I know we're in mid-retreat, but I have to head home for such and such. I would want a damn good excuse, you know? But when news arrived of King Joseph's disastrous defeat to Wellington's Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army at the Battle of Vitoria, Napoleon had to send Marshal Soult, one of his best commanders, to salvage the situation. Hmm. On the 15th of August, Napoleon left Dresden and advanced against what he considered the most urgent threat, the joint Prussian-Russian army of Silesia, commanded by General Gebhard von Blücher, soon to win the nickname Marshal Vorwärts, Marshal Forwards, for his aggressive leadership. <laughs> what, always move but forward? But Blücher followed the new plan and retreated when he learned of Napoleon's advance. Napoleon then received news from Marshal Saint-Serre, holding Dresden with 20,000 men, that Schwarzenberg's gigantic army of Bohemia was approaching, and the city and its supplies were in danger. Napoleon left Marshal Macdonald to keep an eye on Blücher, and raced back to Dresden, sending Van Damme's first corps to threaten Schwarzenberg's communications. By the time the Allied assault began, enough reinforcements had arrived to fight off the attack. Wow. The next day, despite being heavily outnumbered, Napoleon ordered a counterattack. Struggling through mud and heavy rain, 
Marshal Murat's advance, supported by Victor's II Corps, broke the Allied left flank and took 13,000 prisoners. The Allies had suffered a disastrous defeat because they'd ignored their own rule. Don't take on Napoleon in battle. That's true. Wow, almost four times as much. But news soon arrived that turned the situation on its head. Marshal Oudinot had resumed his advance on Berlin with 66,000 men. But in three days of heavy combat around Grossbiren, yeah. he was defeated by Bernadotte's Army of the really? North. Some of the most savage fighting was between Napoleon's Saxon allies and von Bülow's Prussians, two German states that for now remained on opposing sides. Three days later, at the wow. Katzbach River, Blücher inflicted a crushing defeat on Marshal Macdonald, driving some French troops into the river itself. Macdonald lost 30,000 men, three eagles and a hundred guns. For Blücher's 20... Wow, he lost three eagles as well? That's, that's not good, oh my god. 2,000 casualties. Wow. Three days after Napoleon's victory at Dresden, as Van Damme's corps pursued the Allies, it became trapped in wooded valleys around Kulm and was overrun. General Van Damme himself was dragged from his horse by Cossacks, as he and 10,000 of his men were made prisoner. Wow. Napoleon sent Ney to take over from Oudinot, who engaged Bülow's Prussian corps at Denewitz. The Prussians, fighting to save Berlin, held their own, until Russian and Swedish reinforcements arrived to turn the battle decisively in the Allies' favour. Ney's retreat became a rout, with the loss of another 22,000 men. Napoleon's brilliant victory at Dresden had been completely overturned in just 10 days. The Allied plan was working. Napoleon became increasingly frustrated as Allied armies withdrew wherever he advanced and advanced wherever he was not. His teenage conscripts were exhausted by constant marching and famished as Saxony had been stripped bare of supplies Thousands fell sick, thousands more deserted. Russian and Prussian light troops were now operating behind Napoleon's army, harassing his communications with France. Many of Napoleon's marshals advised him to pull back to the River Rhine. But Napoleon wasn't giving up Germany without a fight. Yeah, I mean, it's just, at this point, he's just going to fight to the bitter end. It seems like he's not going down without losing everything. Um, I don't know what I'd do in his shoes, but maybe he should have taken that deal, you know? Leipzig. By October 1813. Napoleon faced a third of a million Allied troops in Germany, converging on him from three directions. 900 miles away, Field Marshal Wellington was crossing the Bidassoa River into France. Oh, wow. The first enemy army on French soil in nearly 20 years. While the Kingdom of Bavaria, a French ally since the days of Austerlitz, had secretly agreed to switch sides and would declare war on France on the 14th of October. Napoleon planned to defend the line of the River Elbe. But the arrival of General Bennigsen's reserve Russian army freed up Blücher, who suddenly marched to join forces with Bernadotte and forced his way across the Elbe at Wartenberg. Napoleon went north with 150,000 men, wow. seeking the decisive battle that would change his fortunes. I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to end up having to retreat all the way back to Paris at this point. But once more, 
Blücher narrowly escaped him. Then came news from Murat, who'd been left with 67,000 men to cover Schwarzenberg. The enemy had bypassed Dresden, and was heading for Leipzig. If the city fell, Napoleon would be cut off from France. Once more, he was advised to fall back to the Rhine. But instead, Napoleon ordered all his forces to concentrate at Leipzig. He would risk everything in one great battle to decide the fate of his empire and the fate of Europe. Wow. All right, you guys, let's, uh, let's have a chat about that. Um, it's not looking very good for Napoleon. I mean, he, in my opinion, he needs to retreat. If he's going to have any type of fighting chance, uh, make sure he stays west of the Rhine. Uh, but, I mean... I get it. He's still trying to expand, so he's trying to hold on to that one last spot, Leipzig. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to end very well. I do know a little bit about uh, how Napoleon's life ended in the later years, so I do know what it ends what ends up happening. Um, I know a little bit about the Battle of Waterloo, but uh, not much other than that, I guess, when it comes to Napoleon. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we only have, I think, three more videos or something like that. Two more videos, something like that, uh, on this whole Napoleonic series. Um, I'm I'm actually really excited to watch the rest of them because they've been so interesting. Uh, but afterwards, I hope you guys are excited because I think I'm going to dive straight into the Marshall series. So it's also Epic History TV, but uh, it breaks down the whole lives of uh, his marshals, his famous marshals. Um, each one gets their own video, so there's some that I'm really, really excited to learn about. But uh, yeah. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Until next time, this is Ace Sai, and I'm out.